Okay, so um, today we're going to be looking at some samples from Clear Lake, Iowa, and um, I'll have with me uh, a guest, one of my students, Addison, um, who's actually working on these materials for her master's currently, so she's a graduate student, and she'll be joining us in a second. <clears throat> Between now and then, um, I'll just make sure everything here is working. Hey, how's it going, Pacific? Uh, just trying to get things rolling a little bit. We've been actually using the scanning electron microscope for the past hour or so. Really, Addie has. Um, so I think everything should be fine. I just need to like make sure all the Twitch settings are functional which they appear to be. A little less complicated when I don't have guests joining me through, uh, you're lurking. Oh, okay, well, that's good. Uh, when I don't have guests joining me through like electronic devices uh, who are just like sitting here in the room with me, it makes things a little bit easier. Um, Addie's not super chatty though. So of course, uh, I'll be trying to keep the uh, conversation a little bit more active um, and interacting with people, uh, yeah, in real life, guess, exactly. Um, and I don't want to move too far from where we were because I think she might have been looking at something in particular, but, uh, we're currently looking at a navicula. This is Navicula oblonga, which is a common large diatom in the western part of the U.S. in many of the lakes that we look at. Um, a biraphid, symmetric diatom, and uh, here's the raphe that runs through the middle of the valve. Now Eddie's back amongst us, so I'm going to move out of the way and let her take over. out over here, off to the side, like Ed McMahon, <laughs> making comments to Johnny Carson, my old tiny reference to people. <laughs> <laughs> Back when I was a kid, we didn't have TV. How are you doing today? Pretty good. <laughs> Pretty good. You ready to stream? Yeah. Are we on right now? Yeah, okay. Fine. Okay. Hello, everyone. I got it all warmed <laughs> up for you. I just need to uh, get myself set up over here. The larger problem, obviously. so that I can uh, keep track of what's going on in the chat. Micah is here and they say hi. And Pacific Plankton is here, but she's lurking. So we like lurkers, it's fine. And Alex and Boswell is here, they say hello. Hello, Alex. We are looking at some material from Clear Lake which is a lake in Iowa. And uh, cores were collected. Do you remember what year the cores were collected? I want to say 2017. It should be on all the samples. Yeah, so yeah. 17. 2017. Mm -hmm. Hey, Cinnamon. I haven't seen you for a while. Um, so yeah, the cores were collected in 2017 by Broxton Bird and his team of limnological uh, core collectors actually does a ton of field work every year and um, uh, not last year 
Uh, and actually, not the year before either. So Broxton fell ill, uh, some sort of rare disease that lowered his immune system, and he had to get some sort of, uh, you know, special living in a bubble sort of settings uh, that went on. What is that? It's right here. Yeah. It's a mystery egg. Then you do it. Oh, yeah, I don't know. Then you breathe, and then you not The sound probably could be turned down. <laughs> we want to startle Addie every time somebody <laughs> does something. Oh, it was Calathon. They were subscribing. Uh, for half a year, they've been subscribed to our channel. Um, and that means that uh, I probably should work on getting uh, badges for half years, uh, people. Um, I haven't made any badges in a while. Uh, I think the last one I made was for three months, so... Um, and then there's bf uh, 3 Ludi who says, hello, like that. With long, long L's and O's. And Astro Kanak is here as well. They say good afternoon. Everybody's greeting us. <laughs> They're very excited to say hello. And uh, we're happy to have everybody here. And I can uh, I give a little shout out to our friend Astro Kanak. The only Canadian astronomer on Twitch who isn't in Canada. Or they're in England for some reason. Still Canadian though. Yeah, I think they make a, I think there must be a six month badge that you're supposed to get for subscribing for that long. So I'll have to upload some new artwork. I've been pretty lazy about uh, art recently because I've been super busy with classes and, I don't know, research, I guess. I do a little bit of research. We're doing research now. Mm -hmm. um, when you get to a certain point as a, a professor, your research starts to be everybody else's research. Like, it becomes pretty hands-off. It's like, oh, <laughs> I guess I just taught some people how to do research, and then I kind of hang out and help them. Um, or at least I hope I'm helping. Uh, oh, Micah also subscribed. And they're on month seven. So good thing I turned the sound down or you'd be startled right now. Uh, we like the long-term commitment. We like those people who hang out in here forever and still sort of want to look at little things with us. So most of what Addie's been looking at is diatoms, although I have uh, identified at least some pediastrum in your sample mm -hmm. um, that we sort of float past. What are you looking for in particular? You said you were sort of scanning for monorapids? Yeah, monorapids and then also the punctus striata. We, oh, I know I have the, that. Back for punctus striata. So yeah. I've been, I think I'm able to lump them out. I think, um, <laughs> but it never hurts to have more pictures of them. Yeah. So. Yeah, yeah. So what do we have right here? This is probably like an ensinema or is that what it is? Okay. Oh yeah, I see the end there. Do you feel like I was quizzing you? <laughs> yeah. In front of everybody, sure I'm just going to start quizzing you. <laughs> You know, the good news, Addie, is if you get it wrong, only I will know. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not totally true. We do have sometimes, <laughs> occasionally, uh, oh, look, a phytolith. We sometimes do get uh, other diatomists that show up, mm -hmm. but um, I don't know that they've ever been, like, aggressively <laughs> challenging the taxonomy. Uh, especially for the students, mm -hmm. so I think you're probably okay. We don't, uh, we're in a, a safe place for people to learn. Judgment-free zone. Judgment-free diatom analysis. 
and if people in the audience want to suggest different uh, genera for what we're calling things, feel free to. Um, even if you're wrong. So what you have on the screen right now, I can also play with my new command. I made a command for uh, sending people to a web page. Uh, with the right genus. That's a Cerarella. Mm -hmm. And if I did it correctly, aha, uh -huh, I did. So I can use this cool command, which is just uh, exclamation mark G followed by the genus name. And then it only really helps if you know how to spell the genus name, which I do uh, for almost all of them. In fact, Cerarella is one of the hardest ones to spell, and I did mm -hmm. fine with it. So also one of the hardest ones to say. Usually yeah. I tell Cerarella. people it's Cerarella and they say Suriella and then I have to correct them. Yeah. It's Cerarella and then, I don't know, it helps if you spell it, I guess. Mm -hmm. But uh, whoever put that word together, they didn't do anybody any favors mm -hmm. because it's like rural king, you know what yeah. I mean? It's like putting the R's in between, like two R's with a vowel in between them is really challenging to say. So, uh, and I'm not trying to make fun of uh, accents. But in Japan, they have a hard time telling the difference between L and R. And mm -hmm. so, like, whoever put Cerarella together, just, like, it's, that's got to be torture for, like, Japanese people trying to speak English because the R's and the L's are just, mm -hmm. like, right next to each other. It must sound like they're saying something crazy. So the, the characters, you know, like, the R and the L sounds aren't in the Japanese language. They just have an R sound. So, like, they, oh, don't, they don't know, know how that. to pronounce L's. Um, I had a Japanese exchange student when I was in um, in high school, uh -huh. and uh, and they would get candy that said straw belly. <laughs> like on the side, it had Aww. straw belly listed, and I was like, oh, uh, because they can't pronounce. I mean, uh -huh. L and R sound the same to them. So. Uh -huh. uh, not all of them, obviously, but it's a challenging combination of letters. So I always feel like Cerarella must just be like, mm -hmm. like if I had. As a young kid, if I'd have known the word Cerarella, I would have just been like, practice with this. <laughs> it's hard for me to say, so, you know. Yeah. I just realized, like, maybe a week ago that this entire time I've been spelling Alica Cyra wrong. Mm -hmm. So I've, I mean, I've learned something, I guess. You can say it correctly. Yeah. So there's that. Yeah. I, uh, there's some words I misspelled for a really long time. Um, I mean, diatom words, uh -huh. and um, like the hardest ones to spell are things that, I don't know, like they're super long words like meningineana, like mm -hmm. that one is just like, I don't even, I never expect anybody to get it right. Yeah. When I see it, I'm just like, yep, nope, they got it wrong again, because uh, it's super long and then it's got weird combinations of letters. Uh -huh. Halothon says that it's their understanding that Japanese has a sound that's halfway between R and L, so hmm. it's like something sort of like like, but we would, he, we hear it as R, but uh -huh. uh, but it's like halfway between R and L. Maybe a really good person to ask is um, uh, Jans, because he speaks Japanese, mm -hmm. and he knows all kinds of stuff about Japanese. He spends some of his streams, he will stream, like, uh, translating Japanese newspapers and websites and stuff, so he would be a really good person to ask about that. Um, kind of a curious, languages are kind of fun. I mean, they're fun in the sense that I don't, I guess I don't speak that many of them, so. Telephone says they tried to learn Korean, but they had two sounds that literally could not hear the difference. Yeah. This is always the problem. It's like you're raised learning language and then you just can't hear, um, you can't hear the sound difference. There's something subtle about it or there's just like, you know, where our brains replace the sound with the sound we think it was. Consciousness is a really weird thing. And like hearing and like all your perceptions are not what you think they are. No matter what you think they are, they're probably not what you think they are. Um, you know, there's this sort of process where we, we perceive that we're seeing the whole room at the same time. There, you ever read anything about this? Uh-uh. Oh, you can only see about like 9% of your field of view. And the rest of it is because your eyes are darting around constantly. And oh they move gosh. in these little micro movements that are so fast 
and then your brain puts those pieces together for you in your wow. head. Wow. And so, you, I mean, imagine you can only see like 9% of what you're looking at, and then the rest of it, your brain is just going, yeah, I know what's there. And it kind of like That's puts crazy. Bits and pieces of it together. And we perceive it as being able to see like, I mean, you, you, you can't see those things. You just uh -huh. can't focus on them. That's crazy. Um, and they made these really cool uh, psychological experiments. I read a really cool book by, um, uh, it's uh, Daniel Dennett called mm -hmm. Consciousness Explained, where he talks about like this program they made where it tracks your eye movements and it can track those little micro darting eye movements. And it would build like the paragraph of words. It would make the rest of the words all nonsense, except for where your eye was looking. And then you couldn't tell. Like if oh you were trying goodness. to read it, your brain could not literally tell that the paragraph was gibberish around it. But if you took like a screenshot of it, it would be all gibberish. And then the words that your eyes were looking at would be the That's only things that you could actually see. So it's like um, your brain just puts pieces of things together and uh -huh. it revises things too. It's not, um, it's not as... Uh, as unidirectional as you would think. Mm -hmm. Like your consciousness is a really weird setting. Um, you tend to think of it as like, okay, even if you, even if you, even if you think, okay, that's that's cool. Your brain's putting pieces of it together, but it's also like revising things that you saw previously. Mm -hmm. So like, there's sort of a squishiness around where you are in time, like where your brain is in time, and it's it's making adjustments oh forward and backwards in time with respect to what you're seeing. And they had these really cool experiments where they had like flashing colors on a screen and it would flash two colors and then your brain would see the color that was between them, like wow. in between them. And the problem is of course that there's, there's a sequence, right? So that uh -huh. it's like flashing red and flashing blue, flashing red, flashing blue, but your brain sees purple and My it would goodness. see the things between them. And so the only way for your brain to do that would be to actually average what it's seeing in the past and what it's seeing in the future, like at, at present, right? And then it's putting the two together and perceiving them as purple. So I was just like, I don't understand my brain anymore. <laughs> like I read that book and I was just like, I need to read this again, but I just don't understand my brain anymore. Like anything yeah. that you actually perceive is not what you think uh -uh. it is. And um, I mean, it's, it's really like, freaky. like it's completely trippy. You read that and you're just like, uh -huh. what? <laughs> When we think of ourselves as like being the presence, ooh, that's a cool little opinion layer. Mm -hmm. We think of ourselves as being like the presence in our consciousness, like there's a me somewhere, but like your brain is more like um, a palimpsest of these sort of revising components of your memory and your presence. Uh, it's super <sighs> weird. Anyway, it's really that's one of my favorite books that just like blew my mind when I read it. I was just like, what? My brain is going backwards and forwards, like looking at what's today or right now and like you know, milliseconds before and blending them together. Uh -huh. Anyway, super cool. Cinnamon says, uh, Japanese is a sound poor language compared to English. They don't have a TH and a B sounds. Oh, that's weird. It's saying, Table of uh, Sick Maniac says they're getting a black screen image. They can only hear and they can't see. Huh. Uh, but I'm actually watching the stream, and I can see. Um, so it might be on your end, table sit. Um, I'm not sure what the problem is. But on my end, um, we're streaming and there's, uh, there's an image. And I can definitely see it. Yeah, Micah can see and hear it as well. So you might just need to refresh your browser, or maybe it's the... Um, the settings that you have. It could be that we're on like really high-end uh, visual settings, like we're in 1080p, so it's possible that it could be related to that because um, we're uh, streaming at a high uh, quality. I think that it, Twitch would somehow give you an option for a lower quality feed, but um, it seems like we have an image for me. Oh look, Mallory's here in the channel. She's like uh, too lazy to walk over to the lab and hang out with us and has decided she's just gonna kibitz from the sideline. Um, how you doing, Mallory? She's 
blessing us with her presence. You don't want to distract from the science. I'm over here talking about consciousness and you're worried about that? I think I'm going to change the slides because I've seen... Jump to a new sample. We just went from the bottom of the sample collection that you have to the top, mm -hmm. right? Yes. So hopefully there's a big change or a modest change at least in what we're seeing. Oh, this is a cool little diatom. Pinularia or Calanese. I think it's Calanese. Yeah. yeah. No, I'm not seeing any Calanese yet. The only real difference between Pinularia and Calanese is like the width of the stride. Okay. So you might mistake it for Pinularia. Mm -hmm. We're not in just chatting. That doesn't matter. Also, I could change the category if you really wanted to. We have a window. Oh, that's true. It would be nice if we had a window in here. Instead, mm -hmm. we have bookshelves. Filled with old magazines from National Geographic from like, I don't know, the 60s or something. There's a PDF from right there. Mm -hmm. So it looked like little kaleidoscope uh, shapes in the light microscope. In the SCM, they look a little bit more crazy. Addie's not having it. It's like, I'm here for the diatoms. I don't care about yeah. the green algae. Let's see what else. Find some cool things. So you prep these stubs? Mm -hmm. All by yourself? Yep. And then we also had you do the sputter coating by yourself? Yep. And today, mostly started the SCM up. So, I'm working on getting Addy up to speed. Getting and, there. And you'll be able to replace me. This is visual ASMR and occasionally attempted real ASMR. Except for I'm not really attempting to do either of those things. I did mark it as visual ASMR because I feel like there's a lot of cool textures that people see and uh, I don't know. It seemed like a good category to stick it in. as much in this one. In the, uh, in the winter time, I was putting my coat over top of the pump, like making a mm -hmm. little quiet shield for the last couple of streams, and then uh, it got warm and I don't wear a coat anymore. So. I'm so happy it's gotten warm out. <laughs> Are you? So happy. You're tired of the cold? Yes. <laughs> That's understandable. I was finally able to get outside and work outside, which is my favorite. I have been able to recently get out with my camera. I don't know if you saw. Uh-huh. Um, uh, just around campus, and then I went to um, Hawthorne Park. Uh -huh. Those are two places I usually haunt when I, wa when I want to go take pictures. Um, but I actually brought my camera with me today. I have, I have it in case, uh, in case I need the image from birds. Uh -huh. But this is my current camera. Actually, this isn't my camera. This is my lab's camera. Uh, it's going to be mounted on the microscope, but I needed to test it out, so make sure it was working. But this is the biggest lens I own. Uh, when I want to take pictures of the moon, this is what I use. Pretty nice lens. Mm -hmm. And uh, also does a good job with birds, turns out. <laughs> turns out if you can see the surface of the moon, you can also see birds over there. Wow. 
What are we looking at now? Stephanodiscus. Stephanodiscus, yes. Mm -hmm. This is Stephanodiscus nigeri. Yeah. So nigeri is usually separated from other species by the number of spines between each uh, set of fascicles. And you can see the fascicles in this field of view. So if I grab your mouse for a second, it's these dark lines that are between the little blobs or circles. Mm -hmm. And so there's a fascicle, here's one, there's one. So there's like a, a sort of a wider one and a skinnier one. Uh, and every two fascicles, there's a mantiflotoportula, which are these things. Mm -hmm. And mantiflotoportula in stephanodiscus are always linked with a spine. So there's a spine, there's a spine, there's a spine, and it's every other interfascicle. Uh, there's a there's a, uh, a mantiflotoportula. Mm -hmm. So it's like one, two, one, two, one, two. Occasionally there'll be a third one that's, that sneaks in there, um, but usually it's just one, two like that. And then you can see that there's a rim of portula. I think there's one here. Mm -hmm. And there's one here. And normally they would also be one somewhere down here because they're kind of like, uh, you know, uh, mud cracks or something. They're going to occur in 120 degree angles, roughly. Yeah. Uh, if there's three of them, if there's four of them, they would be sort of in 90 degree positions. Um, I don't actually see one down here, though. I don't know. It should be in this zone. Mm -hmm. I don't see one. But uh, on the outside, the rim porch is associated with like a slightly skinnier tube. Mallory's given us an update. Something flew in the window? Do you mean like through the window? Or do you mean like into the window? Or do you mean like by the window? Because I feel like you're, you're, uh, She's asking for help. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if, what you mean by uh, in the window. Like, is it in the, did it break the window? Oh, it was fuzz, Never mind. <laughs> Critical fuzz concern. Do you know what this is? Um, I should. It's, it doesn't look super feature yeah, full it's at not. the moment. Is it a intermedia, yes. Lindavia? Okay. Yeah. It's Lindavia intermedia. It's an external view. Yeah. It's a little bit of clay or something on the mm -hmm. outside of it, which is kind of making it look like it's all one blob. Yeah. You can't see the detail very well. All the fuzz. Everything with Mallory. It's always so much drama. Oh no, something flew the window. Into the window or onto the window. So most of what we're seeing, Stefan Viscus Oligocyra. Mm -hmm. And Oligocyra and more Oligocyra. Yeah, tons of Oligocyra. And then occasionally some giant. I'm not sure what that is. Actually. I don't know what that is. Oh, do you have a. Could it be a Nitzia? Probably. Looks like it's a big Nitzia. Yeah. You can skip it. Yeah. <laughs> Permission granted. Nitzia, I, we don't care. I don't. Not not a fan. Nobody is. <laughs> is this just a top to Alexira? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. If you zoomed in, that part that you were zoomed in on right there. Uh huh. Uh, rate. Right to the left of where your box is, there's a little gap right there. There, okay. That is where one of the spines fits in. Okay. 
Um, so I'm going to guess this is granulata. Do you have something like granulata in your sample? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I guess that's the furrow that the spine fits into. Okay. And there's another one, you know, like around the clock at around 2 o'clock. Yeah. Yeah, okay. right there. Those are little furrows that the spines fit into. Uh, so this is probably a linking valve. Mm -hmm. This is Snovacula longa. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A lot more fun um, in the game after you've looked yeah. at the samples for a bit, right? <laughs> when you can kind of put a species name on stuff yeah. and you're like, yeah, I know that one. <laughs> Not quite as challenging. Yeah. So this is sort of an interesting one. Do you know what this one is? Um... Some sort of navicula? It's a navicula, yeah. Okay. Um, I don't think it's a blonga mm -hmm. based on the shape because a uh, blonga is like usually parallel edges. Yeah. And if I were to guess just based on what we're looking at, it's probably like navicula aurora. Yeah. Do you have that in your yes. sample? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> I'm going to, uh, Mike had tried to type it. They wrote navicula wanga. And uh, it's close. You'd get credit. I'd probably give you full credit on an exam for that one. Navicula oblonga is the one that we saw the first time. Hey, there's a monorapha. Is this one Caryavia? Yes. Okay. Look at you. It's like you've been trained <laughs> taxonomically to identify things, <laughs> and you're applying it correctly. It's so weird. And the one that she just found, I'm going to do this cool command. There's Navicula for you. And the one that she just found, she's already moved on. Yeah. Uh, it's Caryavia. It's Very probably Caryavia clevii. Or yeah, look mm -hmm. at you. She even got the species right. This is what we're dealing with now. The sort of confidence I like to hear <laughs> from a student. And just gonna throw the species name at me and be like, I think it's this one. Let's see if I spelled that right. I think I did. Boom. Huh? I didn't have to look mine up. You were thinking of the movie Hot Fuzz? Were you thinking of it right now? Or are you thinking of it before? Quite as much in this one. There's a lot of dirt. Mm-hmm. Ooh, I just. And you found a cerverella. Another one. Have you tried to identify these two species? Yeah, I've tried. <laughs> what do you have as a name I... for this one? Yeah. I honestly couldn't even tell you because it's not very abundant. Yeah. But they're, um... they're super uh, clear when we see them in the SEM. That's yeah. the same thing with the pinularias, right? It's uh -huh. just sort of a sense of. Um, size bias that we have yeah because when you look at the sample you think oh look there's the cerarella and there's these pinularia and you should see those all over in your samples but yeah in fact you don't usually count them because mm -hmm. when you actually do the counts these end up being super rare right so yeah. your eyes drawn to them because we're zoomed way out and you're looking around for stuff and they're mm -hmm. big and this is sort of traditional like large object bias that we have um and it's something that makes uh, it makes it really critical that you actually count diatoms when you count diatoms, right? Mm -hmm. Because um, otherwise, you'd probably look at it and go, "Oh, the sample had a whole bunch of these things," and then when you actually go back and count it, you'd find that it doesn't. Yeah. Uh, that you're, you know, you, you think it did because the big things are obvious, but um, when you have to go by 
one field of view at a time and identify everything mm -hmm. on it, it's the little things that end up usually overwhelming yep. your sample. Like those Stefan Discus Night Gary we keep seeing as well, but you don't mm -hmm. really have that many of those in your sample view. Mm -mm. So no. we see a lot of Olicocera and you have those in your sample, but they're, um, there's a lot of them yeah. on our stubs that we're looking through. So. You haven't seen Hot Fuzz, Micah? I feel like you should watch that. It's a good, uh, you know, afternoon comedy hour. You know, when Mallory isn't available and we need something to make us laugh, Hot Fuzz will probably do. This one is a Sororella, which I've already sent the G link for, but I'm gonna do it again. Cause I wanna see what they have on the website for Sororella. And I'm too lazy to type it. So I've got this cool command I wanna use. People could use it too, but you know. Not if you spell navicula like Micah does. It's not going to take you to the right place. Uh, if I had to guess, let's see. It's like this one? Mm -hmm. Can Canera? Yeah. Yeah? It sort it's of something tapers similar to, a, it to tapers that. It to a bit uh -huh. of a point at one end. Not yeah. a really sharp point, but a sort of leaf shape otherwise. Yeah. And they don't have any SEM images of it, mm -hmm. which is, uh, all I can say about that is we can provide them with some now if they want, yeah. right? We've got plenty of samples. Uh, all we have to do is make sure that this is actually Tanera, mm -hmm. and then we could send them some SEM images. This one has some rocks on it. Yeah. But, uh, you know, their pictures actually have some junk on them too, so it'd be fair. Got it right, I think. I think that's the right species. Dell has shown up, and also Blue Z. Hello. Uh, I get the command for Dell. You should give Dell a follow. <laughs> uh, not Panera. It's Tenera. I know it's hard to hear me with the mask on. It's probably part of the issue. It's Sururella. Tenera. That's what I think. Yeah, it's an error. The, clearly the, um, the, uh, what you call it, captioning thinks I say Panera. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna call my diatoms Panera and then I'm gonna see if I can get Panera to send me some free bread. Uh, Cause I will eat it, especially if it's their dessert breads. Any kind of pastry from, from Panera. I love Panera. Hey, look what you found! Do you know what this is? I do know what it is. It's... We need to take a picture. Yes. Is this a, is it a sponge spicule? It is. Okay. Do you know what and kind? And then it's a... Uh, I know I should know what kind it is. Because we just did this last week. Um, well, it was like two by, weeks ago, actually. By, by Rodel? Is that... I think it is, yeah. Something like that. It's a birodal. It's a, what are they called? Sclera? Mm hmm. Mega sclera? The other so, one. I don't know. No, the other one. It's like a uh, sclera something or other. Gem. Gemnosclera. Gem, yeah. yeah. That's it. You got it. Hey, Sarah, how's it going? Uh, these are, uh, what we're looking at now is a, yeah, gem, gemosclera which is a part of a sponge, a freshwater sponge in this case. And um, was Addie thrown out a really technical term, birodal, which is like uh, when it has two of these sort of cap end structures mm -hmm. that look like, uh, I don't know, what are those things that you, uh, you throw up the side of a building and then it kind of anchors you and oh. you climb up with mm -hmm. them. I can't remember what they're called. 
Um, off the top of my head. Grappling hook. Yeah, that's it, Lizzie. Yeah. Grappling hook. For some reason, I kept trying to put a C word in there, but it wasn't a C that was coming to mind. They're like little grappling hooks on both ends. Um, so, yeah, if it has uh, both ends where the grappling hooks are sitting on it, yeah, it's birodal. Pretty cool looking. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is made out of silica. So like the diatoms that we've been looking at, um, and this was processed using the same techniques. Um, sponge pickles and chrysophytes and phytoliths are all likely candidates to end up in our samples. Um, I don't know if you said Carlin processed these. I don't know if she used hydrogen hydrochloric acid. So we might have gotten rid of all the carbonates um, if there were any. But yeah. um, all the silica stuff will basically be preserved, right? So anything that has a siliceous component. So this isn't a whole sponge. It's just a little piece of one. And uh, sponge spicules are made up of like all kinds of different little elements, um, which we learned in, in Chad's class a couple of weeks ago when we were focused on sponges. And um, I learned a bunch, so that was cool. Um, about actual sponges. It's super challenging because you have to have like most of the pieces to figure out mm -hmm. what sponge it is. Yeah. Um, but it, I think this is one of the pieces that they can identify to family or genus or maybe even to species if they have this one. And the other ones are just like extra help uh, that would provide some information. So um, my colleague, Mike McGlue, has a sponge expert who's a postdoc who's with him now. And I suppose we could probably send it to him and he would be able to tell us mm -hmm. just from this picture, which type of freshwater sponge was living in your sample. It's uh, Gemma, is it Gem no or Gemma? Gem, Gemma? I thought it was Gemmy Low. Gem Gemmy Low Square. Gemmy Low yeah, Square, I think. something like that. Something like that. <laughs> Uh, yeah, a sponge can grow from these, so like it's like some sort of reproductive component, right? Mm -hmm. I think the gem the gemma part is the part that like has the um, has the uh, reproductive part of the the sponge. Mike says they're gonna try to spell everything from now on. <laughs> I think it's actually fun, in a nerdy way. <laughs> uh, and also could lend to some very enter high entertainment, for me at least. That is some sort of a green algae piece. I don't know what kind. Um, just off the top of my head. Mm -hmm. It could be another piece of pediastrum. Mm -hmm. Hard to say. This uh, soft buddy stuff is kind of impressive that it made it through your processing. I know. Um, it goes to sort of leads us to um, having a greater depth of like appreciation for the lignans that are in the plants yeah. and the algae. Is that a chrysophyte cyst that's right next to it? Looks like it. Oh, it's a cool oh, one. Yeah. Look at that. It's that's got pretty. like all kinds of cool little lines on it. So that is a chrysophyte stomatocyst. And um, that was the week before. <laughs> so <laughs> in Chad's class, we've been working our way through some of the siliceous microbe fossils. And then recently we started working on uh, the calcareous micro fossils that might be of interest. Um, and this one is a chrysophyte cyst, a stomatocyst. Normally, you'd be able to tell because they have an aperture, but the aperture is um, faced away from us into the actual sample. I saw it come into freight there, but yeah, somewhere around there. It's about as good as it's going to get. One of the problems with looking at round things is that no matter where you focus, some of it's going to be out of focus. Mm -hmm. So just try to get the thing that you think is the most appealing in focus, I suppose. Your depth of focus is currently 1.2 microns, so 
Um, if you're chrysophyte and yours is probably more like five microns, you're mm -hmm. only going to be able to get like a quarter of it in focus. Yeah. So. Chrys it's so close. Crisis fight. Yeah. It's, uh, you guys are doing a great job of butchering it. Um, Sarah says it's like a tiny armadillo. Uh, I'm going to spell it for you. Chryso. Stomatosis. There you go. Isophyte stomatosis. Most of the ones I actually see don't have any sort of ornamentation on them at all. So have you been kinda... counting them? Mm -hmm. You are just yes. like just uh, all of them into one yeah. category. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's how I usually deal with them as well. Yeah. Um, just. In the off chance that someone out there is going to be a chrysophyte fan and <laughs> wants to look at my samples, I can say, yeah, there's there's chrysophytes in there. Yeah. Um, they're usually lower abundance than diatoms, but that's not always the case. Mm -hmm. The beaver lake stuff that we were looking at, uh, oh, we didn't look at beaver lake. I have some beaver lake samples from beaver lake in Montana, and the chrysophytes outnumber the diatoms like three to one. Oh, and wow. And there's a lot of diatoms in the sample. It's just like chrysophytes everywhere in some of the samples. Wow. Um, and I had dug those out if I thought I actually had the raw material form so we could look at them in mm -hmm. the SCM, but I don't. Um, yeah. I only have light microscope samples from Beaver Lake, but um, those things are crazy. The whole thing is just all full of chrysophytes. Yeah. And uh, I almost analyzed Beaver Lake along with my thesis work, but um, my advisor decided I'd done enough. <laughs> hey, we're being raided by Spider ID. That's awesome. Hi, Spider ID. You know what? I have a special command. It's this one for squad. These are people who use microscopes to stream on Twitch. And you'll notice spider ID that you're in my list of people who use microscopes to stream. And you've been there, comfortably placed there for quite a while. Uh, thank you for the raid. So um, if you're a person who is watching spider ID and you're interested in the scanning electron microscope uh, work that we're doing here, but you'd also want to look and check out some other people who use microscopes on uh, on Twitch, then you should um, check out that list. Uh, a Tiny World is the person who sort of got me interested in streaming on Twitch with the microscope, but she hasn't been on Twitch very much recently. And uh, Pacific Plankton's like, and Dell are like my two good buddies here. OpenSet also is a good friend of the stream. Pizaria is usually does a bunch of singing and music, musical stuff, and recently has been also doing art, but she also has a microscope and will do some streaming. And then, of course, you guys all know Spider ID. If you don't, you should follow Spider ID. Uh, he uses a stereo microscope to look at um, uh, spiders. And if you are triggered by spiders, I don't recommend that you either go there and become desensitized to them because they're not as scary as you think. Or um, if you're not, you should also go there and check out it because um, he does really cool. It's got a really nice uh, stereo microscope. It's the same one that we have in the lab, Addy, uh, for our mm -hmm. lab that we use for occasionally looking at other things that are larger than diatoms. Um, most of the work that I do on Twitch is usually from the SEM right now. And then I do a little bit of light microscope streaming from home occasionally. Um, but uh, probably as the summer sort of encroaches, I'll start to do a little bit more light microscope streaming from, uh, from work as well. And then occasionally I've had stereo, mic we've used the stereo microscope to stream pretty infrequently, but um, we use it for uh, micro manipulating samples. I need to have something where I can see stuff and well enough to pick it up with our micro manipulator and, uh, and put it in place. And the stereo microscope is great for that, so. Um, so if you're interested in uh, in microscope streamers, you should check, definitely check them out. Check out that whole list. Um, Pacific and Dell and OpenSet are usually hanging out here in the channel as well. Uh, Dell Maximum's here. You can you can chat with him. Um, Dell likes to stream um, also games and stuff from and uh, and you know he does a whole variety of things. But uh, he has Hydra, and um, so if you're really interested in kind of super strange organisms. Uh, he knows a lot about Hydra and he also has some really great footage of them where he has them eating and um, crawling around and, and, uh, and asexually reproducing, uh, budding is what it's called. Um, 
so you should definitely give uh, Dell a check. He also looks at other things besides Hydra, but usually freshwater samples. And then Pacific Plankton is um, on in the evenings um, from her light microscope. She looks at mostly samples from San Francisco Bay um, in the plankton. And she collects samples twice a week, like fresh samples, and looks at live organisms. We don't look at live stuff here very frequently, although occasionally when I'm on the light microscope, I'll put uh, water bears or something like that on. Um, or diatoms or something like that. But most of the time, because we're looking at stuff in the scanning electron microscope and it requires uh, a vacuum, gold coating, and, um, and also the samples are being bombarded by electrons, uh, we typically don't put living things in there. And if we did, they probably wouldn't live for very long after they went in. So uh, we don't see a lot of wiggling things on my stream. We mostly look at um, the remains of organisms. And uh, right now we're looking at some diatoms from Clear Lake in Iowa. And um, the person who's running the SEM is uh, one of my students, uh, Addie. And she's a graduate student here at Indiana State. And um, I'm not on the screen, but I can put myself on the screen. <laughs> I'm here. I'm just off to the side, trying to keep as socially distanced as possible and still be able to see this uh, scanning electron microscope so I can assist Addie in her decision making about, I don't know, whatever it is she's taking pictures of. Um, I've just let her run wild with it recently. This would be a good thing to image. Mm -hmm. I think that that is probably your Lindavia Intermedia. Okay. I'm not completely convinced it's Intermedia from this view, but um, it's in the Lindavia family. So. All right. Uh, Trying to keep up with things. Um, Dell has a bunch of spiders in his bathroom. A friendly lady that lives behind his toilet and his daughter has named it uh, Freddy. It's probably a lady, uh, but I guess Freddy could be a lady. Uh, let's see. Yeah, uh, Pacific had a really uh, great stream on um, on Monday night. Um, there was like just a ton. We just kept getting raided like one after another. Um, and I usually moderate for uh, Pacific Plankton, so I hang out in her channel and help her identify diatoms that she sees and also kind of control the chat room. And then uh, usually she reciprocates and shows up in mine and hangs out. And sometimes we'll also be present in each other's streams, chit-chatting. Even though she's in San Francisco and I'm uh, in Indiana, um, we've sort of been hanging out on, on Twitch all the time and make good friends. Um, so that's nice. We don't really get to spend a lot of time watching Spider ID because he uh, he's European. So he usually streams earlier in the day. And I saw he was on when I came in this morning. Um, and I started looking through uh, Twitch, and I thought, oh, he's usually never on whenever I'm on. It's like not the same day. So um, I just watched a little bit of what he was doing, and then I had to start getting ready for uh, for my stream. But I'm really excited that you raided. That's uh, it's great. Let's see. Uh, the Mighty Rancho says, hi, Addy. And they thought that that was you talking the whole time instead of me. <laughs> Eddie's really quiet. So I try to talk, I try to force her into talking all the time and usually not very successfully. So it's just a uh, perpetual state. You get used to Eddie not talking very much. Um, she's, a, she's very thoughtful though. She's thinking a lot mm -hmm. behind the mask. Always thinking. So uh, I, I usually have um, at least a couple of times in a month, I have some of my grad students in the channel on stream with me while we're looking at some of their materials. So this today we're actually analyzing some real samples that uh, are part of uh, Addison's thesis work. And um, so, you know, like I'm the talkative one and she just basically <laughs> hangs out and does the work. That's good. It's a good situation. Um, and then I have some other graduate students and also some undergrads who also will hang out with me. It didn't highlight, it unhighlighted mm, itself. It keeps doing that. Yeah, the mouse is being weird today. Um, is it, you're still in two to three? 
I think I. You're, yeah, you're in three. No, you're in three. No, I'm, I moved now. You okay. Moved. Three to four. Uh, yeah, the time difference is usually a, a struggle for me in, uh, in Spider ID. It's like I'm at work when they're streaming usually, so. I'm at work now, uh, but, you know, I'm usually teaching. My perpetual, like, schedule of being busy doesn't help. So if you're wondering why is it, uh, why is everything in black and white instead of color, it's because the scanning electron microscope doesn't use light and um, it's just beaming electrons down on the sample. It allows us to get a lot better resolution than light would and so we can get a lot closer to very, very small things. Uh, of course, as I mentioned, we have to put them in a vacuum and when they're diatoms, we also have to plate them with gold to try to make them more conductive so that the electrons won't get built up on the surface and cause our diatoms to, um, to glow too much, what we call charging. And then, um, so uh, there's another thing that I often get questions asked, which is why does it look like it's taking so long to download the picture? Uh, but the scanning electron microscope is actually building the images as you're seeing them. So um, it's not using light to do it. It's scanning like an old school TV does across the screen and very rapidly filling in each pixel with information as it does it. So it's clear that that's a sort of like a video camera without any light um, right now when we're, when we're moving. Uh, when we speed up the, uh, the rate of the scanning and it's at a fairly um, high rate right now. So when we move, it basically just redraws the screen at a very high, uh, low resolution. And we can change the speed settings and we decrease the speed setting basically. It's, it's still scanning, it's still building the image, it's just doing it much more slowly. So um, it requires some patience. And normally I'm running things by myself. So I use the time when it's scanning to, when it's collecting images and I'm scanning those to, uh, to see what's going on with chat. And now I have hands-free operation. I can use my mind control to make Addy do things. <laughs> And, um, and then I can just read the chat whenever I want, which is nice. So it's a very subtle form of mind control where I just ask her to do things. There's not very much in this one either. Time to move on if that's the case, yeah. right? I mean, on the bright side, we've been um, at it for about an hour now and we're halfway through the samples. Hey, you found a really cool diatom. Oh, don't tell me what it is. <laughs> okay, I won't. Uh, I can see the image on diatoms in North America. <laughs> is it like cam? It is. Campylodiscus or That's something it. like that. It. Okay. Look at this chain. Okay. I feel like I've successfully trained her. She just can look at it. <laughs> Have you ever seen it in the SCM before? No. Have you ever seen it in the light microscope no. before? And you can get it to genus. Yeah. See? This is how, uh, that's how learning works. Now we're in the experiential learning phase. <laughs> we're actually applying what it is that you were taught. Yeah. Right? So, um, Campylodiscus look like a Pringle chip. Usually people call them like, oh, if you're going to take a picture, can you just move it just a little bit? This way. Yeah. Just this grab way. it and drag it if you have to, but it just needs to be like, so the whole thing's in there a little bit more up. There you go. Okay. Because I don't have very many pictures of Campley Discus, so I'm okay. invested in you doing a good job. Well, then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna <laughs> to zoom in and make sure it's yeah. in focus. Do a really good job with the focus on this one. This is uh, one of the things about the skinning. Like, there you go. That's sharp. There you go. Okay. The back's going to be out of focus a little bit. That's okay. <laughs> and you can actually do a second photo where you like highlight this part, this part? or you could just... Okay do that part if you don't care about the being able to see the ray feed. But I actually kind of think this is okay. a nice and artsy. Yeah, I'll do this. We can handle two pictures of the same yeah. diatom if it's a good one. So this is uh, Campylodiscus. And uh, as I mentioned, it's kind of the um, 
Pringle chip of diatoms. Camp E low discus. I can do this. Boom. And if I spelled it correctly, it takes you to a web page. I did it. Uh, also one of the harder diatoms to spell. I misspelled this diatom for like, I don't know, five or six years. I thought it was Campliodiscus, but it's actually Campylodiscus. So, um, fortunately, I don't think I ever misspelled it in publications because I almost never see it. But um, it's a really cool diatom. It's shaped like a saddle or a Pringle chip. So if you're coming from a country that doesn't have Pringles, I apologize. I used a, um, an object that you might not recognize, but uh, you could educate yourself. Just type Pringles into Google. You'll see what I'm talking about. It's a potato chip that's basically shaped exactly like this thing. Um, and uh, a sort of, sort of saddle shaped if you would prefer something more conventional, I suppose. Um, and then uh, all of them have this same structure. They're, they're sort of saddle shaped like this, uh, or Pringle chip shaped. So people usually just call them potato chip diatom. Uh, they go really well with the Olipocyra, which people usually refer to as the beer can diatom. So as mm -hmm. long as you have your potato chips in your beer can, uh, it's a party. But uh, the thing that I think is really cool about Campylodiscus is, uh, one, they have a really weird shape. So probably why you recognized it and remembered mm -hmm. it, because they have this like really bizarre shape. Um, but two, and this is something you can only really see well on the SEM, is they have crazy spines. Like, look in the background at the top where your cursor is. Uh -huh. There's like a whole forest of little oh, spines yeah. associated with them. And that's what I want you to zoom in in for the okay. second photo. Try to highlight that area, because they're super cool. And a lot of times when I find them, they're just covered with junk. Like the spines are there, but it's like there's a lot of mud. Because uh, they're shaped like in a structure that would collect mud easily. Mm -hmm. Pretty cool. Bitter Boo has a question. Did I miss it? Is it from way above? Oh, how do you prepare your samples to get it under the SEM? And how does it look to the naked eye? Um, uh, I could explain it in a lot more detail for you guys at some point. Um, I prefer to do it maybe when Addie's not sitting here trying to get her research done. But um, the SEM samples are prepared by putting them in a sputter coder, which is probably mangled by my uh, text-to-speech, speech-to-text uh, thing. But it basically uses electro electric energy to create a plasma version of metals and then they're deposited on the samples. And then um, uh, that basically gives them a fine metal coating. It's basically the same way that you electroplate like jewelry if you want to make your jewelry uh, gold plated. It's a similar process. Um, how does it get there? Yeah, so that question, Bitterboo, is actually, um, these samples started off as mud in a core and we digested the mud with uh, all kinds of chemicals. In this case, um, we just used, I think, hydrogen peroxide. Mm -hmm. I don't think we actually used nitric acid on these samples, but mm -hmm. you can. Um, and that gets rid of most of the organic matter. It turns it from uh, carbon into carbon dioxide, which is a gas, and then it basically goes out the hood uh, that we, ooh, there we go. Now we're looking at spines. That's the, wow. that's the cool part. Now when we zoom out, when we have that in focus. Very cool. So Kimply discus almost always have these really cool looking spines on them. We can get the whole thing in our a little bit higher. Good. Perfect. Okay. Uh, so we process them basically and then they're in a liquid state, uh, like there's a, a wet sample with uh, whatever is the residue that's left behind. In this case, anything silicious will be left behind. And then I just take a couple of drops of that. I sort of shake it up, or in this case, Addie did, shake it up and put it on the stub and let it dry on the stub. And so it just basically dries onto the surface. Uh, the little metal cylinders that you can see like down below us um, in the little chamber view camera, um, those are the surface. We're just looking at the surface of that, those little metal cylinders. Um, but we just dry them onto those stubs and then um, in this case, we then put them into a sputter coater, and the sputter coater puts the gold plating on them, and then we just stuff them into the SEM. So they, once they're dry, um, we can, we can um, 
you know, uh, electroplate them basically with, uh, with gold or silver or really any metal. Ours uses gold because it's highly conductive. Yeah, we could do sometime a full stream where we go through how we process the core and sample the core. Um, it kind of requires me to have a core. I mean, I have a bunch of cores in the refrigerator I could pull out, but they're not uh, being analyzed right now. So it's like a whole separate process. Um, I think it's actually kind of fun um, uh, to talk about. But um, for these samples, yeah, they're just dried onto the stubs. And they're being held on there, probably now partly by the gold plating, but also when they were initially dried onto them, they're just being held on by probably electrostatic charges and maybe a little bit of the residue that's in the water. You know, it basically turns into kind of a crystallized form when it dries and uh, whatever little part, you know, micro particles or whatever that are in the water probably congeal at the boundaries of things and actually cause them to be adhered to the surface. So if we went in with a, um, a probe of some type and touched this diatom, it would probably pop right off of the, um, of the surface. So we have to be careful not to touch the surfaces of them, um, or we could scrape the diatoms right off of there. But as long, I mean, as long as it's on there and it's electroplated, you could hold it upside down and it's not going to fall off of there. Um, there's enough electrostatic energy and also the gold plating probably provides enough of a connection to the surfaces to um, to keep them stuck on there pretty well. Yeah, so we could do that. I mean, that's an option, I suppose. Um, it would require me to probably bring my core into this lab. So this isn't a wet lab. That's the issue. Um, and everything that happens in the SCM lab is basically uh, we prep it someplace else and we bring it in here and keep this place pretty clean. Um, my microscope lab, where's, which is where all this stuff gets prepped, uh, I just put a 2 on there or something, I don't know, or A or whatever, yeah, it's fine. I'll put A. Whatever you want. Okay. Uh, all the work for like prepping samples is done in another lab, and so um, the, the actual like internet connection is pretty good in the building, but the phone connection is really poor. So uh, when I tried to stream and we go from one lab to another, it usually doesn't work super well. But um, I could do is, you know, run a little stream where we're in the main lab and then I turn it off and turn it back on in this lab uh, so that we could um, sort of showcase the two labs and what goes on in them and how they uh, function pretty differently, pretty independently of each other for the most part. Um, but the samples that we prep for light microscope work and the samples that we prep from the SEM are all done in that one lab, typically, and then brought into this lab as the part that we are analyzing here. So. But I think it would be fun to talk through the process of actual coring, um, and I could actually showcase the cores. And in fact, uh, maybe when the you know, it, it's been cold, and also we've been kind of locked down the entire time I've been streaming. But it would be sort of fun to actually go out into the field and bring people along on uh, on the front end of this as well, where we collect the core, um, so you could actually see the coring process. And my guess is that sometime this summer we'll actually do that. I've got uh, Addy plus Laura plus five undergrads who are going to be in my lab this summer working on stuff. Uh, you know, like normally you think, oh, it's summer, everybody goes on break. Um, on summer, I usually get a lot more work done than usual, which is saying a lot for me. But, um, but I also have a ton of students who are usually in my lab over the summer. And so um, the power for me to like, uh, just take a break just doesn't really happen. I'm also usually teaching a class in the summer as well. So I'm going to be super busy this summer. You know what this one is? And could you zoom in just a little bit so I could sort of see the structure of the... Oh, yeah. Can you try to just get it super sharp? And maybe it already was. It's pretty good. Any idea what it is? I'm not sure. It's... They both curl to the same side. Unless I'm just They're almost in the that. middle. They almost don't curl. But yeah, you're right. like the ends, the yep, they're deflected a little bit. Yeah, the terminal or proximal proximal ends. ends. I'm not 
sure. It's some if you, symmetric. If you saw it in the light microscope, you'd know what it was immediately. Uh -huh. uh, probably. I mean, maybe you haven't seen a lot of these. Um, but it, it, it's so distinct in the light microscope that actually it's a little confusing in, uh -huh. the, in the SEM. Uh, if you look, there's like right next to the raphe, there's like a, a row of uh -huh. like a landing strip uh, adjacent to the raphe. And that is the secret that would actually help you figure out what it is if you knew, if you knew the genus. So I don't want to leave you yeah. on the hook. This is a nominees. A nominees. Yeah. Okay. And um, that little landing strip is really obvious. Uh huh. And also, when we get to the middle, you'll see there's usually some sort of asymmetry associated with the um, uh, the central area. So like one side usually doesn't have a bunch of uh, rafi, yeah, or sorry, stri on it, and the other side has stri. So you see this sort of white lines that are going across the screen? Mm -hmm. Those are associated with that little pebble. <laughs> and so the pebble has basically got a whole bunch of charge, and when it moves the scans across yeah. the surface, it hits that charge, and then it creates those artifacts on the actual image. There's not a whole lot you can do about it, uh, other than maybe turn the image or zoom in or out, because mm -hmm. um, it, it's going to have an influence no matter what you do. So if you zoomed out a little bit, you might actually get it, the lines to go away, or maybe it won't. I don't okay. know if it'll... Let's try. If it will or not. The bright side of that is... Um, that's probably far enough to see. Uh, you can always fix it in Photoshop. It just takes a little bit of um, mm -hmm. a little finesse. You can't just <laughs> put, put it in there and say autocorrect, but you can. Um, yeah, it's still happening, just not as obvious. I'd say do whatever you want. It's going to be there. It's going to have to be fixed in <coughs> in um, post production if we wanted to use that image for something. Face mask or discus? All right, I guess so. Um, Omnominominis, that's exactly what I like to call it. <laughs> We've seen this on Dell's stream before. He's had some anominis on there, and that's what I call them, omnominominis. Um, uh, like Cookie Monster, right? Mm -hmm. um, 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 um. Yeah, you can rotate it a little bit. That might help, but it probably will still put the lines on there. So, And I'm going to make an attempt to spell it correctly. A nom o e o means, and we'll see if I got it right. Dang, I'm good. Spelling's my thing. This okay. One. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I've not seen it in light microscope. If we had a so. diatom spelling bee, stand back, bitches. <laughs> Nobody wants to mess with me in a spelling bee anyway but especially not a diatom spelling bee. <laughs> now they're all excited about the om nom nominees part. Om nom 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 nominees. It's really kind of cool because I've gotten to see a lot of different stuff today that I've not seen, so. I don't think we've ever had anomalies on the SCM mm -hmm. uh, at all. I mean, it's not that they're super uncommon. It's just we haven't seen a lot of them. Yeah. And I think Erica was looking at some samples that had anomalies on it, and she super wanted to get some pictures of them. She was super excited about it, and everyone we looked at was like either covered with clay or broken. It just yeah. wasn't very good. Mm -hmm. um, so this one's nice. It's clean. The surface is basically completely clean. And you can see um, in the middle, there's like a sort of, um, like a rough texture, uh -huh. like next to this sort of, uh, there's like a little, uh, in in this area. Yeah. Um, outside of the raphe, but before the stri, these things, um, on the light microscope, they appear as ghost stri, a okay. little ghost areoli, actually, just independent areoli that mm -hmm. are um, like little ghosts, uh, partially visible because the silica is a little bit thicker there. Um, ghost are just fun to think about. But in the SEM, they, um, they aren't, uh, it's more obvious what's going on. It's like a thickened piece of silica in that little middle area. Yeah, Del says he sees them often enough. They look like amber lemons. Are amber lemons a thing? Never heard of that. I've never heard of an amber lemon. <laughs> 
though. And neither has Abby. Yep. Uh, so the center part's not a poor field. And because uh, it's just got a bunch of areoli in there. A fake areoli, I think, even. They're not even real. Uh, but we could zoom in on it if you want to do like an artsy shot. Yeah. Look at that. <laughs> you could zoom super close, then we can see what's going on with some of the central area stuff. Yeah, so see there's like a little divots um, right there. Mm -hmm. Yep. Those are the little uh, ghost pores. And these are the um, proximal ends of the ray feet. And I think you have it pretty good in terms of the quality of the image. And those little dots that are next to it are really kind of cool, aren't they? Yeah. So, I mean, you can Let's compose see. it how you like, but I think this is a nice, interesting shot. Yeah, let's do it. And now we're doing science art <laughs> with our artist, Ed. Later on, I will colorize this one and stick it on Instagram and tag it. Cool. Or maybe on Facebook or whatever. I don't know if you use Instagram very much. It's a good one though. Very sharp. Also, we're finally making use of all that work we did with the stigmation when we started. Mm -hmm. yep. <laughs> like, <laughs> all your pictures so far have been like from way out and it's like, yeah, we didn't really need to be so close, I guess. But this one, mm -hmm. you can start to see why it's useful to have that stigmation yeah. done and uh, all the detail on the surface of this is like super interesting. We have a quiz, I think, but we're learning about fecospherulites. So, yeah, however you say that. <laughs> I'm not sure I would win that spelling contest. <laughs> Maybe. Um, little pieces of calcium carbonate that get stuck in your food. Mm -hmm. Which is interesting. Yeah. I'm just happy that Chad hasn't asked me to put any of his poop particles on my SEM. <laughs> Although I guess it would be pretty interesting mm -hmm. to look at. These yeah. creepy ends are really cool looking. Yeah, they are. Nice job with the photo, Eddie. <laughs> This I is me good. being your supervisor. I'm giving you positive vibes for your great photo you collected here. Excellent work. Uh, let's see, Calathon says, I heard that wrong. I know I heard that wrong. I'm assuming it started with an F. It is people. Fecal, just like it sounds. Fecal. Sphere you. Sphere you o light or sphere you light? Sphere you light. I think. Sphere you light. Fecal sphere you light. They're little poop particles. When you eat things like spinach, it has a bunch mm -hmm. of uh, calcium oxide particles in it. And then. It's like uh, calcium carbonate that the plant deposits. And, uh, and then your body, when you digest it, your stomach acid is obviously acidic and it easily digests the calcium carbonate. Uh, and then when it moves through the rest of your body, the pH changes back to something a little bit more basic and it precipitates the calcium carbonate in your intestines uh, as a particle. And then 
uh, archaeologists will find these and go, hey, look, people pooped here. Or something pooped here. Because, uh, you know, they can't always tell it's a person. Combination of uh, weird and gross and also very interesting. There's a bunch of green algae up there. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Eddie's not having the green algae. He's like, nope, we're looking at diatoms. Trying to find some more exciting stuff. These just aren't as dense as some of my other ones. I don't know. The stubs, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. You know what you should do is um, blame Mallory. <laughs> just I know because? We, just blame Mallory? We discussed Mallory. earlier that you actually made these stubs. Yeah. But, um, oh, that's nice. There you that's go. That's kind of cool. I'm going to take a picture of that. Very cool. This is a naviculum. Mm -hmm. uh, if I had to guess, like if somebody was like, figure out what species it is from your memory, I would go with uh, Rycardii. Mm -hmm. But I don't know what you've seen. So that might be just like a wild guess. Rycardii actually might be a little fatter than this one. Um, it's a, it could just be another Aurora. And then in the bottom left hand corner, there's a phytolith you accidentally stuck its toe into your photo. Oh. It's a tiny little phygolith is down there. You did hear it right. Uh, pretty interesting. Poop, poop spirit. A poop spirit. Uh, you're making them right now, especially if you had spinach for lunch. Uh, I did not, but I did eat some plants, so it's possible. Does it happen with marine animals? Um, I don't know. I mean, a criteria that's associated with it is you have to have like an acidic to basic tract in your stomach. And it doesn't happen with, uh, it happens with ruminants, but it doesn't happen with like bunnies or something, mm -hmm. right? It was like a certain group of animals that it doesn't actually happen with. And, um, ooh, that looks good. Uh, you know, Chad gave us all kinds of information about it, but have you studied for this quiz yet? No. So at three o'clock when our stream's <laughs> over, that's what you're doing. Yeah. This uh, uh, diatom that we're looking at is navicula again. It's uh, this one, the G, navicula, like that. Studying is overrated, Kayla Thon says. <laughs> Spoken like somebody who probably didn't have to study uh, today for something. So this little thing right here, I'm gonna take control of your mouse for a split second, if I can find it. Here it is, where'd it go? This thing. Mm -hmm. There's a matching one on this one, where there's a defect, and that is your void defect right there mm -hmm. and right there, and that tells you the primary or secondary side. So when it started depositing the silica, yeah. it started on this side and deposited the valve, and then it wrapped around to this point. You can see it's in the same place on both sides. Yeah. That's the void uh, defect. So if you were being very careful, you could refer to one side as the primary mm -hmm. side and one side as the secondary side of the valve and in the order that they were made. Uh, yeah. You can actually even tell that from, uh, from just looking at that little defect. Um, and that's just because like it's putting down the silica, it was uh, polymerizing the silica into these shapes mm -hmm. and then uh, it ran out of space to make things perfectly. And so there's always okay. like a little weird gap Okay. And it's like, I think I know what to do when I get these pieces together. It's like a little bit like when my daughter tries to write a sentence yeah. and it's like 80% of the words are on one line and then there's like a, ah, crap. Like, so there's like the word either does this, you know, like comes off the line and goes yeah. down or, uh, or she just like starts writing it on the next line. That's basically what the diatoms have done. They they couldn't figure out like, oh, I was building this perfect thing and then they got around to the outside and was like, I made too much space. <laughs> you didn't put any spinach in your pasta? Well, you know the thing is that they're totally harmless. They're gonna form in your body and then you just poop them right out. And as long as you haven't uh, had your remains trapped in some sort of archeological dig, you'll be fine. Uh, it's a, it's 
it's a completely harmless process. Uh, I was confused how to use them. Yeah, I know. Because I thought, That's well, you can't tell whether it's like an, an animal or a human. You just see them. Yeah. And the different shapes maybe tell you something about the pH, but I don't know how that helps. I mean, it's the pH of your gut. Yeah. So, yeah. like, I mean, unless that's specific to a group of organisms or something, I don't know how that helps. So it's like, oh, well, you can tell something pooped here. <laughs> that's it. Cool. Yeah, that's about it. <laughs> that's a piece of a sororella that you jumped past right mm -hmm. there. Yeah, the old school Semetopleura, new school, new school, new school sororella. And there's a bit of a gyro sigma mm -hmm. up there. Oh, it's the whole gyro sigma. But it's like being covered up by something else. Taking a nap with uh, <laughs> another diatom. They're having a polite afternoon nap between species. Between the corpses of species, to be honest. <laughs> Oh, does somebody in the channel actually study, study gut content? Is that what Bitter Boo does? We have some samples where we looked at the diatoms of um, fish, where we've actually pulled them out of the guts of fish and then processed the material. It's a project that I started with the undergrad a couple of years ago. Um, and uh, we need to have more samples made from that and have it analyzed a little bit more closely, but a um, pretty interesting outcome from some of it. That could be a project somebody could work on for the summer. But um, I've got all these students who want projects to work with things on the summer, but they don't want to do any of the projects I have. <laughs> so I'm like, <laughs> okay, well, <laughs> I guess we'll come up with something new for everybody. For some reason, they don't want to do what I want them to do. It's so weird. <laughs> I'm switching. You're done. <laughs> We're on to sample four of seven. Actually, it timed pretty well. Mm -hmm. I mean, I guess you might not be happy about how dense the samples <laughs> are, but with respect to like getting through all of the samples, we'll probably yeah. have perfect number. And then you know next time when you make it, make it a little denser. Yeah. Or yell at Mallory, <laughs> even though she didn't do anything. <laughs> Dang it, Mallory, why'd you make these so bad? <laughs> Actually, I think they're fine. Yeah. yeah. My solution is to do a whole bunch of them in low, concentrations. This is a good, this is an interesting diatom you found. What is that? Well, I, you're supposed to tell me what it is. Well, I thought it was Alakasira and then, it is. okay. Then you made me second guess it. Oh, sorry. I didn't, wasn't trying to challenge your <laughs> understanding of it. It's not the, it's not granulata. Yeah. And I'm not sure what it is to species, which is why I thought it was interesting. Yeah, I don't. Alec Asire gives me a hard time sometimes. Gives everybody a hard time. <sighs> it's not just you. I always think I got it, and then something will just not look just right. Well, it's good we found but, this then. Yeah. Maybe this is one of the not looking right mm -hmm. kind. Oh, DNA metabar coding. Okay, that's cool. I have friends who are diatom metabar code, code analyzed people. Um, what kind of things do you usually look at? Also, I've got friends who study fish uh, upstairs. Uh, Hugo is one of our professors here in the biology department. He studies um, DNA of fish. Not their gut contents, but um, we're working together on a project with him looking at some rivers in uh, Portugal. Looking at, we're looking at the diatoms and he's looking at the fish. Yeah, it's got interesting spines, mm -hmm. and uh, the shape of the valve is sort of like hockey puck, mm -hmm. right? 
so not quite what I would expect from Ambiguo. Yeah. And um, so that's a good, it's a good thing to get a picture of, because mm -hmm. now we at least know what it looks like in SEM. Yeah. And we can compare it with Ambiguo and see how well it looks or matches. This is like the one that we thought could be ambiguous, right? Yeah. But it's like probably. too barrel shaped, mm -hmm. a little too wide relative to its height. If it's the same thing, it's relatively common in my sample. Samples, uh, so. Ant Nomer says uh, this diet palm looks like shredded wheat the cereal. Yeah, except for it's barrel shaped. Uh, but it does have sort of a shredded wheat like appearance. Mm -hmm. These ones would be frosted wheat because uh, we put gold on them. So. I'm not a fan of. Shredded wheat? Yeah. Frosted wheat? I'm not. Though? Yeah, I'm just. Can't I mean, I'll it. I will eat it if I have to, but it's not not my favorite. What would what would be the scenario where you have to? <laughs> like, there's nothing else. For me to eat at home. You're at the bottom Jared, of the food. Yeah. The cupboards are bare. All that's left <laughs> is a little bit of milk and uh, shredded wheat. And you're like, I guess so. Someone in your family eats shredded wheat, though. Yeah. My Jared eats it. Husband. Your husband. Yeah. So he's probably happy with this arrangement because yeah. then he has all the shredded wheat to himself. Yep. This is how my all of the things I eat in the house, I'm like, I want to eat things nobody mm -hmm. else likes. So that it's always around when yeah. I want it. Especially want to make sure that nothing that I like to eat is anything my daughter likes to eat. Uh -huh. Because she will like, oh, Doritos? And then she'll just eat the entire bag of Doritos in one sitting because she's seven and can do that. But you're not a fan. Not a fan. Not what's a fan. Your, what's the thing that you set aside as cereal that your husband won't eat then? Um, my, what I eat is like, um, what's it even called? Honey Bunches of Oats. Okay. I love that. And it, it's sort of a similar situation. He, he will eat it, but it's not. Only if he's forced to. Only if he's forced. So you keep him well stocked with his shredded wheat and then he keeps yeah. his mitts off of your honey nut. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds like a good arrangement. Bitterboo says mostly spiders. Oh, and food webs. Okay. Hey, Luan's here. Now you have to actually start getting things right because we have another diatomist <laughs> in the channel. Hello, hey, Luan. How's it going? Uh, it looks like it has a thin rubber coating uh, that is wearing off from the middle to the bottom. So those are actually the... Oh, you can see the little holes mm -hmm. in this pinnularia. Uh, that is actually the, um, the girdle band on the diatom that goes around the middle of them. And the girdle band, in this case, for that previous one that we were looking at, probably was actually kind of wearing off. Um, it's like a thin silica layer that's uh, wrapped around the outside of the valve. And um, it doesn't quite wear down, but it, uh, it can dissolve off pretty easily because it's pretty thin. One, we're looking at um, diatoms from Iowa. And Addie is my grad student, which I don't know if you met her before when you were here. She's occasionally on as my guest. She's doing all the work, and I'm just sitting around acting like I know things, which is basically how I always am. It's primary, primarily how I act. And people agree with me because they usually don't know what I'm talking about. That is a cool diatom you found right there. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Is it another Surreal? It is a Surreal. It used to be, I, I think actually that was always Surreal, that one. But it's super wavy, mm -hmm. like a Campylia discus. 
not campo discus, like somatopleura. Mm -hmm. um, and this one's also, well, they did away with the uh, somatopleura, so it's easy now. You just go, oh, it's it's probably a sororella. Now, almost all of them got dumped into sororella. Some of them got stuck in iconella, but um, usually in order to tell what's iconella from sororella, you have to look inside those little tiny windows around the outside mm -hmm. edge. And so, like, I don't know, it's super hard to even see into them. So if you just go with sororella, nobody will complain. This one has got, like, a torsion. So, like, it's not only, like, wavy, but it also is twisted. Mm -hmm. So you can see that extra when it, the photo starts to develop. It is the rear of let's see. Uh, oh. uh Lobophil LP Lobaki Lobaki LP says I work on a river in Germany repairing ship locks and stuff, so I see a lot of river mud and stuff when I work. The ship locks are pumped dry to work on things, and there's always a, a lot of sediment, algae, and mussels on the bottom, and it's interesting to see how they would look under the microscope. So that is probably a lot of what you're seeing in that sort of muck and sediment at the bottom of those things is probably diatoms, um, like the things that we're looking at right here. So pretty cool. Uh, by equivalent Guy equals eight pigs to over C4 says, do diatoms have mitochondria inside of them? They do. Uh, mitochondria, mitochondrial DNA is something that people often look at uh, from diatoms. And then Luan says, I was looking at your last publication earlier, the 3D biovolume, because I think I want to do something with biovolumes. Ah, that's a pretty cool paper that uh, my former student, Joe, and I um, just published. It just came out, um, I guess, two days ago or something like that, three days ago maybe, uh, where he took diatoms and he did 3D modeling of them. And he used uh, like AutoCAD to actually build the diatoms in three-dimensional space using modeling techniques. And then put the pieces together in the diatoms and figured out an algorithm for like how big they need to be for how many pieces they should have for each one at different size ranges and then use that to get an estimate of biovolume uh, and not only just biovolume but we can also calculate so not how much like space is inside the diatom that where it might have organic matter but also the skeleton itself we could calculate how much silica is being used by the diatoms which is not something that other people have been able to functionally do um, because they usually just use like a shape that's roughly similar uh, as an approximation for diatoms. So it's an intense amount of work on the front end to um, to build the three-dimensional models for the diatoms and to do all of the SEM work to get those correct. But um, if your population doesn't have very many species, it's probably a pretty cool way of getting at a lot of that information. So. Uh, Uh, Sven says, I had many reads of Cyclotella meningineina in mussels, but the database isn't that nice. So uh, we could miss a lot of these little cereals. Cere I think they mean cerealas. It's funny, it's easier for me to say cereala <laughs> than it is to say cereal. Uh, let's see. Um, yep, so it's Cyclotella meningineina is pretty common in a lot of uh, river settings. I would actually expect that as something that you would find. They're tolerant of uh, high nutrients and salinity changes, and those are two things that you'd expect to see in most river settings. So, uh, Ant Nomer says, we should print 3D diatoms, and I've got news for you, Ant. We have, and we do. And um, I should probably put a link to the um, Joe Mohan's list of 3D printed diatoms on uh, Thingiverse, but you could just go there probably and um, and uh, you could download his uh, models that he's made for free and print them yourself if you want. So uh, he's done this with about, I think, seven different diatoms, ones that we've described for the most part. Like if it's a diatom, then we put a name on it, and Joe and I worked on the paper together. He probably made a 3D model of that diatom. Uh, so they're, you know, 
it's a small selection of the very large universe of diatoms, but it's uh, important ones for me because they're ones that I put names on, uh, like I actually described. So, uh, and he doesn't have one for all of them, but in fact, this diatom that I was holding in my hand was made using photogrammetry techniques on the SEM um, from SEM images only, uh, using 3D modeling techniques and Edgesoft software uh, to do the photogrammetry and then a little bit of editing to get rid of the uh, clumsy bits that the modeling software didn't draw correctly. But um, that's also a diatom that I've described. So uh, just as a trend, I guess, in order for us to, to get stuff done, I need to describe species, I guess. Um, what'd you find? I'm not sure. Hmm. Uh, you know what that one is, I bet. I bet if you zoom in in the middle part, it'll be obvious. Oh, it's the inside view. That's why you don't know what it is. Well, is it a nidium? It is. Okay. It's a nidium. Cool. The insides of nidiums look kind of weird because you can't see the raphe ends, yeah. but the raphe ends are deflected in uh -huh. opposite directions and hook shape. What do you want, Luan? The 3D model? Or you want to be able to make 3D models? Because I have access to that 3D model. I can give it to you as a thing you could print. Um, Somewhere I have it as a in a Google Drive file that I just share with people, whoever wants it. Um, the technique's a little bit harder than uh, to you know to provide to people because that we used about seventy photos of the same diatom from seventy different positions in order to draw that uh, image in three D, um, and then. Like I said, uh, I had to have somebody who knew something about modeling help me because I'm not a modeling expert, but I am a diatom expert. And um, if you want the links for those, I can dig them up for you. The 3D model, okay, I'll dig up the links for you. It's actually not that hard. Uh, somewhere in my stuff I have them. Maybe I can find them for you right now. my Google Drive link. And I can just put it in here and people can download it all they like. Uh, Diatom model. Go. There's a couple of the models, including the June Lake Stephanodiscus one. Uh, it will print out as one half of a model, so just for clarity, it's going to print out like this, and then you have to, you know, make two of them sticking together. But uh, the STL files are there, so if you wanted, to, what's that? What did you find? It looks like it's just a chrysophyte in an alakasira. It's a chrysophyte that got stuck in an alakasira, <laughs> like a little cannonball. I was cannonball. really confused for a minute. Yeah, I was confused too because I thought maybe it was an oxyspore or something, but it's in fact just a little cannonball, uh -huh. a little chrysophyte, a cool looking one. Looks like a mine. Yeah, it is really cool. It looks like something that Super Mario has to avoid. Uh, but there it is stuffed in the bottom of uh, an alakasira <laughs> valve. <laughs> it's not in the right place. That's uh -huh. another thing that would be weird. It's inside the cell. Yeah. <laughs> so that's super funny. Yeah, you should take a picture of it. That was cute. I'm going to. Uh, there's some more models for Joe Mohan. I'm going to find that for you. They're on Thingiverse. Uh, this is not the one I want. Hang on. Mohan. The last time I went to Thingiverse, it wasn't loading his models, but... Um, See if I can 
find them for you. They were, I think they were all together. For anybody who's a fan of Star Cirilla Neo Panada, boom, there's that. And I think if you just click on Joe's name uh, on that link that I gave you, there's six designs that are all there. And if you click on the six designs page, it will take you to each one. Um, so you can get access to them all. They're all free. Uh, there's no charge associated with them. So if you just pop on Thingiverse and click around Joe's name, you'll find them uh, on there if you wanted to uh, make your own models. So. Uh, let's see. Oh, there was a joke? I missed it. What molecule is like Michael Jackson? Diatomic helium. I guess because he goes hee hee. Hee hee. Guy equals eight. Says, I like the idea that there was an evolutionary leap when the organisms, maybe it, I can't read it. A diatom ate a mitochondria. Uh, which are good at making ATP. The mitochondria lives inside this creature. So that's just the idea of endosymbiosis. Um, and they had a symbiotic relationship together. It had some evolutionary advantages that spread and evolved. Yeah, so um, the first stage is, uh, is probably parasitic in some way. They probably weren't mutualistic when they started out, but it ended up that way. Um, it could also be that they're pre predator and prey. Um, but I think that over really long times, they end up evolving together and then eventually become a symbiotic relationship. So it's a pretty interesting concept for the whole concept of endosymbiosis is pretty interesting, but there's a lot of examples of it in nature. Um, there's some diatoms that live inside of forams and there's dinoflagellates that live inside of forams. And there's in fact diatoms that have uh, endosymbiotic relationships with nitrogen fixing cyanobacteria. So um, it's something that occurs commonly in nature now. It's not just one endosymbiotic relationship that's been expanded through time. But in fact, uh, our idea of chloroplasts are likely that chlor chloroplasts started off as independent, you know, like cells or whatever. And they also got abducted and turned into something that eventually became part uh, and integrated into the organisms themselves. So, uh, yeah, a long time ago, a lot of it, yeah. Uh, so Bitterboo asked, is the photographing part part of your workflow you look forward to, or does it only seem so fun for people who stumble across your stream? Um, I actually really enjoy the photographing part. I have a lot of photography in my background. Um, earlier today, uh, I was talking about um, finally being able to go out and take pictures. So um, there's a lot of similarities between the SEM, even though we're not using light, uh, a lot of the um, the concepts are the same as actual photography. And so we are collecting the pictures, not just for fun. Um, it's part of our workflow because Addy needs to be able to look at these things mm -hmm. and compare them against existing species to figure out what they are. So um, uh, it's uh, really important for some of the very small things. For some of the things she's imaging, I think it's also just nice to have images of them. So we're just kind of collecting them because we can. But. Um, but for some of the very small things, um, you maybe won't be able to tell what the species is without an SEM. So, and some of those Olocosyra and some of the other things that we looked at that are kind of on the border, we're not really sure if it's the right species or not. The SEM will help us solve that problem. So, um, you know, it's nice to be able to share it with people. And, um, you know, like, I know it's, it's entertainment for everyone else, but for us, it's actually part of what we need to get done today. And, um, at least for the last several streams, I haven't had uh, a, 
almost all the last streams in like the last two months or something have been analysis streams where I'm just basically doing my work because I don't have any time to um, to do my work otherwise. So I'm actually able to combine streaming along with actually doing my work. It's nice because I can share it and I can entertain people, but I also still am getting the work done that I need to get done. So um, it's kind of hard to carve out time for research for me. And um, the setting up a stream time where I actually do work is nice because it, um, it helps sort of uh, designate that as research time. So um, we do have some streams that are more just like science outreach and fun streams that we do occasionally. Um, but it, they've been pretty small recently uh, just because I've been so busy and uh, I have so many things that I'm working on right now. And I also got a bunch of grad students like Addie and Laura that need to learn how to use the SEM. So we're doing, um, it doesn't seem like Addie is, uh, as, uh, is inept in any way in using the SEM because this is her third session doing this. But um, actually part of what we're doing is training Addie to use the machine. So um, it's a combination of her getting her research done, but also learning how to use and operate the SEM. And we still manage to stream it. So I mm -hmm. think that's actually kind of nice because um, it can, you know, it's, it's secretly, I'm entertaining people, but um, overtly I'm actually just doing what I would normally be doing in this time slot if I had dedicated time for research. So, um, so we take pictures uh, because we're collecting the images for actual research purposes, but, um, but I think that also uh, I then take those pictures and um, colorize them and put them on Instagram. So if you're not familiar with the, um, my Instagram page, uh, all the little images you see that flash in the bottom corner are just a, a fraction of the ones that I've actually changed in, uh, and used for art. And I post them to my Twitter, I post them to the Instagram, I post them into my Discord. So if you're interested in getting one of them for a desktop or something uh, on your phone or your laptop, or if you just want to use it, as long as it's for educational purposes, I'm totally fine with that. Feel free to, or if you just want to have it, um, if you tried to sell it, then I probably would be a little upset. But, uh, you know, because I try to use all of the money that comes into our stream through subscriptions and everything else is it goes towards student research so uh, Addie's using the SEM right now normally that would cost something like um, $100 an hour in a normal lab to use an SEM like this and um, we managed to put um, all kinds of time for Addie on the SEM as a result of being able to use the um, subscription money and also um, for my Redbubble site where I sell if you want stickers or something else associated with uh, Diacom artwork that I've created um, I just use, I just donate all of it towards the actual student research. I don't take any money from, uh, from Twitch or the stream or from my Redbubble site at all. All of it goes towards um, graduate and undergraduate student research. So I buy uh, stubs or um, nitrogen or whatever we need for the SEM to run. And then I also obviously donate my time uh, for the SEM as well. So, um, but those are just part of what I do for students uh, in my lab group. And, um, and then I try to do the Instagram colorizing stuff, mostly to draw attention to diatoms and to help promote science and the research that um, comes out of my lab. So if you follow me on Twitter or Instagram, you'll probably occasionally catch little bits of me actually talking about papers we published or research that we're doing. Um, streams like this, uh, some of the stuff that we collect will probably end up in publications that you might see coming out of our lab in the future. So um, there's a, a real purpose to what we do, um, despite the fact that I am streaming on Twitch. So uh, let's see. Um, I was just reading about a leaf sea slug that photosynthesizes. Yeah, there's a whole bunch of organisms like that, that like, you know, the sea slug is just uh, incorporated some photosynthesizing organism into its body. Um, a lot of them are very interesting. They, um, they acquire the cells after they're born in their sort of early larval phase, uh, or when they get to a site, they'll then acquire the cells that they need um, 
for that symbiotic relationship really early on. They're not integrated into the DNA of the organism itself, but they somehow capture it uh, from their environments. So, uh, you know, they're, they're still two organisms in most cases, even though they're living in a mutualistic obligate relationship. Um, there's some sort of point at which they can't separate anymore, but we still treat them as two organisms because they're not part of the life cycle of, I mean, they acquire them basically after they're born, not during the uh, DNA phase or they're actually being replicated. Uh, Talakot says, I was doing some accounting homework and I asked my dad for help. Oh, they're doing jokes for us, okay. Uh, what is the acid test ratio, I asked, and dad blurts out, uh, it states what the acid test ratio is. I was like, thanks. Oh, <laughs> I see. I was like, thanks. Uh, I should have known that, and Dad replied, it's okay. It's not basic knowledge. Uh, it's like puns, right? Uh, Bitterboo says, I can't really imagine thinking, oh no, it's taking SM pictures day today. Yeah. Uh, you're wondering if it wears off after some years. I would say no. Uh, there's no point at which I'm using the SEM where I'm like, oh, another boring day on the <laughs> SEM. I'm always just fascinated by everything we find. Um, I don't know if it's because my attention span is such that when there's little things that I make very big, I get excited by them, or whether it's just that, I mean, uh, every sample we looked at today, even though there's some uh, debris or this, you have to browse around, we found something and I was like, oh, this is cool. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I don't ever really get to the point where I'm like, four to diatoms, move on. Um, and I guess if there is, I could always look at pollen or phytolists or sponge spicules or endless amounts of microorganisms or microparticles that I would still find fascinating under the SEM. So uh, it's a, oh, we got a party of nine, GeoGym's raiding. Thank you for the raid, GeoGym. Sorry, I'm trying to catch up with chat, which I normally can manage pretty well when I'm not uh, uh, running the SEM. But um, right now, today, my grad student one of my grad students, Addie, is running the SEM, so it's her samples, uh, and she's in charge. I'm just here hanging out, answering chat, um, and it looks like Pacific Plankton has rejoined the actual moderation part. She's sending out shout-outs to GeoGym, so thank you for the raid, GeoGym, and welcome in people who came along with GeoGym. Uh, we are actually approaching the end of my stream, and in part because Addie's got to go study for a quiz she has at 4.30. So I don't know how much time it requires. It's a pretty easy quiz, as I feel like. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, if you feel you need to get up and go, I can take over whenever you want. Okay. Um, I'll try to find one last thing, then I'll probably that's pass the way it I like on to, to you. It. One glorious <laughs> last thing, and then we're going to end the stream after that. Uh, but then it's usually like an hour later, I'm still sitting here going, uh, I found some more glorious things, and I didn't want to stop. Sorry. It's a broken piece of a Stephanodiscus. I think it, you do reach some point where you sort of hit saturation, mm -hmm. um, where I don't think you're bored, but it's like, I've seen this one, I've seen this one, yeah. I've seen this one. So you kind of need to like work a little harder and start looking for littler things to try to find, you know, and maybe that's a good thing. Yeah. Uh, it's got like a little, like a little thing there. I don't know if that's the inside view of an Olicocera or what that is. Uh, it's an Olicocera. Mm -hmm. But if we're going to find monorapids or something, you probably need to get, need to zoom in a little bit. Mm -hmm. the problem with zooming in is you always have more button clicking to yeah. do your results. So harder to find things, but little things are like that. So. GeoGym says they had a fun stream today. And oh, they did a stream of their stream table. That's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. um, we have some stream tables here in our department. And uh, for some reason, the kids find it fascinating for the labs that they have. Uh, have you used the stream table, Addie? It's been a long time since I used it, like for freshman year. For 110 or mm -hmm. something? Yeah, and but it was fun. You don't have to uh, teach because you have a research assistantship <laughs> yeah. position, which is a luxury yes. for grad students. I got system. very lucky with that. Well, it wasn't luck. <laughs> We plucked you out. Yeah. We said, this one's a good one. <laughs> She's a keeper. And uh, I think that's probably because you had classes with both Carlet and I in the same semester. And we were like, yeah. oh, Addie seems really like she's interested in this stuff. 
So um, I don't know. You have regrets? No, not at all. Perfect. That's not what I like at to all. Hear. It's just one of those things. I the more I learn about, the more interested I'm in, and I and I don't I don't get bored of it either. Yeah. So. I think that's critical. Yeah. Uh, for science research, it's really challenging. I was sort of talking this about this the other day when when I have grad students and they just don't know what they want to do, mm -hmm. and then they you don't know why they want to do it, and then I mean it's okay to start out that way. Yeah. But I feel like after like a semester if you've been looking at it and you still feel that way mm -hmm. um, it's going to be problematic for you you need to be a little bit passionate about it or yeah. it's just not going to be um, a thing you can force yourself to do for two years yeah um, strictly so i feel like you know i check in every once in a while see how you still feel about <laughs> it because i think oh i don't want her to get in that position where she kind of hates it and then yeah because um, it could happen uh, but i feel like you know, I have a pretty open relationship with most of my students. Mm -hmm. So if they felt like they couldn't handle something or they didn't like it, I would find some way to make their lives more manageable, I think. So. Stephanodiscus? I think so. Oh, um. Aunt Nomer, if you put a link in the channel, uh, the links will, I think, will automatically be blocked. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, if you send the link to one of the moderators, um, oh, that's a cool that's one. That's a pretty one. Um, or me through Whisper, I probably would post it. Um, or you could post your jokes on, um, also on Discord. Uh, if you wanted to uh, hit hit some of the audience with it, it's a fair number of people in my uh, stream that are also in my Discord. And uh, if you want to continue any of the conversations that we have here, if you want to check out some of my actual research, or you want to uh, chit chat with any of the other people in our community, the Discord's a nice place. It's a pretty friendly community. I don't think there's only like a hundred people in our Discord, but um, or something like that. But uh, just a, something new and interesting happening there pretty regularly. So sometimes we do. I don't know. There's some plan to do some painting, a paint along in the Discord, uh, and sometimes we play games together or whatever. So it's a nice little hangout spot. I even manage to hang out there occasionally. Sometimes I stream stuff into it. Well, that thing has such a weird structure to the actual vowel. Mm -hmm. Like the stray on it are crazy. I know. It's crazy. That's what I was just thinking. Um, so earlier we were talking a little bit about accelerating voltage and why you might want to pick one accelerating voltage over another. Uh -huh. You see how in this area it's white? Yeah. That's because you're actually seeing a particle that's on the underside of the diatom. You're, you're getting the oh, electrons okay. going all the way through the diatom. They're hitting the thing on the other side, and then mm -hmm. they're giving some of the signal back through the diatom. Um, and that's because our accelerating voltage is at 30. Um, we have a nice, clean image. It's highly resolved mm -hmm. um, with the light and the dark areas. But I think, you know, if you wanted to take that picture and you didn't want to have that um, you know, piece of junk visible through it as mm -hmm. easily, we could lower the accelerating voltage down to five or something, take okay. the same picture. You're not so zoomed in that you wouldn't be able to um, see everything clearly, mm -hmm. but it would change the appearance of things. So where the silica looks kind of dark now would probably be very bright because okay. you're not getting as deep into it, mm -hmm. right? So just as an example, but you probably wouldn't be able to see much of that particle if we switched to five, accelerating okay. voltage to five, because it wouldn't penetrate as deeply. And so fewer of the electrons would make it through the diatom to hit the surface on the backside, and then they probably would have less energy to come back out through mm -hmm. the diatom. So we would just wouldn't see it. Um, this is a you know a thing that people, you know, when you're doing your imaging and you're thinking about how you want it to appear, uh, it's not really like it's distracting, but it yeah. would be kind of, um, you know, it's like a, a weird blob. Like why does it look bright in that area? Mm -hmm. uh, but 
I can tell from that that it's one of these little sort of pieces of silk that's um, behind it. So that's a cool image. That's a very yeah. clean, very nice, sharp image. Mm -hmm. And I feel like you got the SEM basic mm -hmm. operations handled completely, right? I think so. Except for We're the getting there. mouse cursor, which is doing whatever <laughs> it wants today and it's not what we want it to do. Yeah, we have a whole uh, we have a whole part of the um, the Discord for memes. So feel free if you want to get in there and meme Let's it up with them. people uh, to to jump in there and hang out. And that's it. You're gonna go study. I think so. I think I'm gonna go study and then eat. Good plan. Eat you haven't eaten lunch yet, right? No. It's the same. I'm hungry. That's the other thing, like, uh, because Addie was streaming, I was actually able to eat my mm -hmm. lunch today. So uh, thanks for that. Um, unlike my normal starving state at 3 o'clock, I've actually already had lunch. So thanks to Addie for holding the fort down for us. And I'm going to probably stream for maybe another 20 minutes or so. Okay. Um, and then I don't think I'm coming to class today because you guys are just doing lab stuff. So um, I'm going to go work do my actual work or some sort of my work I'm not sure if it's the actual work I'm supposed to be doing but thanks for hanging out with us Addie and I will all these got saved so you can come get them whenever you okay. have your USB drive okay, Sounds good. okay. See, ya. see you all right so uh, two things happen when Addie leaves one is I take over control and two I can unmask ah that's nice so, um, because we've been running with the mask on all day, I'm starting to get that, like, uh, mold in my beard, you know? Like, oops, closed the window I didn't want to close. Um, okay, so we can look around a little bit more and add samples, and I'll just c collect a few more images. Maybe I'll find something exciting that she didn't notice. Um, or maybe I'll just take some artsy shots. So, of course, as, uh, as I moved into this position in the, um, in control of the SEM, I, also, I can't uh, as easily read chat. So you'll just have to be a little bit more patient and um, I don't apologize for that. That's just the way it is around here when I'm running things. So, um, you know, uh, it'll be a little bit uh, slower interaction, but I'll just rely a little bit more on Pacific Plankton in that case. Um, you're hanging out with the shark eyes. I'm not sure what shark eyes means. Oh, mind of a snail's here. Oh, cool. Oh, oh, I see in the, I got it. Very cool. Um, what I want to do, I want to type in this little part. I've got a special, uh, uh, command for Pacific Plankton. So you should definitely follow Pacific Plankton. If you don't already, you're missing out. And I, I've i heard a rumor that she's getting a new computer on either Thursday or Friday. And if it's Thursday, she might be streaming from it. So that would be super exciting. Um, and we'll be able to watch the videos of uh, her collecting plankton and whatever else without having any lag anymore, I think. So I'm looking forward to that. And also when she gets alerts, you know, like when people do things like subscribe or whatever, it won't take like 20 minutes to show up. It'll happen right when it happens. So that's another positive. It should be exciting, uh, not only for viewers, but I think also for Pacific Plankton. She'll, she'll be able to give us, uh, you know, a little more reliable connections to the science. There's a lot of just uh, big stuffs and little oligoceras in this sample and not a whole lot else. So I maybe I'll jump back over to seven and see what we could find there. This is sort of where the stream started and it's a little bit denser and um, it's actually the lowest part of the core so this is the oldest sample in the set of samples that um, Addie was looking through. 
These are from Cleared Lake, which is a lake in Iowa, and they were collected from the sediments. And I think Addie's um, range in sediments, they go back about, a, I think maybe about a thousand years. I think that's the target. Um, I don't know that we have a complete age model for her samples yet, but um, it's something like that. That's like our, expection, our expected uh, age range for her samples are from modern down to about um, a thousand years ago or so. And I found a little monorephid in here, I think. It's kind of covered with junk. Um, and there's also an Olicocera with one of its separation spines, and also this one's covered with a girdle band. Gives me a chance to get the focus good, and also I want to change the brightness and contrast settings a little. Um, Lucia, I'm from France, and I ended up in your live, and I find it really interesting. Well, thank you. Um, the SEM stream is actually a lot of fun for me to do. And uh, I think it's the only, still the only place on, um, on Twitch where you can see somebody stream live from an SEM twice a week. Uh, I stream on both Saturday and Wednesday, typically, from 1 until 3. And if you look at the clock, Eastern time, that is, uh, 3 o'clock has already passed. But I usually say 3, and I usually go a little bit longer to like 3.30. And I'm going to keep with that trend, um, in part because I, uh, I like to do at least a little bit of sort of closure um, after we've been collecting stuff. And um, also, I want to raid somebody. So, I mean, we gotta, ultimately, I've got to plan out where that's going to happen and where we're going to go. So here's a, um, a little soft algae. This is pediastrum, um, just a piece of it, which is kind of surprising because we treated these with um, hydrogen peroxide. And here's a little chrysophyte cyst, and I'm going to image this chrysophyte cyst for us. Um, first, I'm going to get the focus super sharp, and we're going to do something in order to accomplish that, which is zoom in crazy close. So we are currently at 91,000 times magnification. And I don't think you'll find that magnification anywhere else on Twitch. Um, but as you can see, the image still needs a little bit of work. And I'm going to try to tweak that for us to try to clean it up just a little bit more. feel like it could just be a little tighter. Um, to get a nice clean image, and then I'm going to zoom out a bit. We'll change the speed settings, and then we'll collect this little Christmas tree ornament. This is a um, chrysophyte stomatocyst, and it has its aperture pointed upwards at the screen. So, or in this case, pointed upward at the um, electron gun. And um, this is the uh, insisted stage of a chrysophyte. They have sort of a free living stage where they are in their vegetative stage or whatever, where they're capable of swimming around and growing and reproducing. And then uh, when conditions get poor for them, which is usually like winter time, um, they will insist, which is a, a way that algae basically go into some sort of hibernation by creating uh, like a specialized cell. And um, in this case, it's, uh, it's like a little Christmas tree ornament shape and the chrysophyte climbs in uh, the cyst here, climbs out of the cyst here when it's done hibernating, basically. And then we'll repopulate the lake um, from, from this, uh, along with all of its peers that also would have been insisted over, uh, usually over winter or something like that. Um, and so the thing that's interesting about chrysophyte stomatocysts is that they, they don't always know which organism goes with which 
chrysophyte cyst um, because the organism looks very different than the actual cyst that it climbs into and hibernates through. Yeah, it's like an orange. Yeah, this one has what I call an innie. Um, if we like to think of these as sort of like its belly button. Um, the chrysophyte cysts have uh, innies and outies, and uh, normally they're outies. Normally there's like a like an actual hanger type thing that would fit on an ornament that would be sticking out from the surface of the aperture. This is the aperture where the organism enters or exits, and um, and this one has an innie. So rather than having a uh, a structure that points outward in a cone shape from it, it has uh, this little inward deflected hole. And then there's a little bit of a structure to this or texture to the surface of it, but it does actually kind of look a bit like an orange. I think Luan is Luan spot on with that one. Uh, it's more or less a globe with one little hole and then uh, sort of this textured on the surface. But in the light microscope, these would just look like um, uh, little balls, little clear glass balls. So, um, Lansoir, yeah. Uh, I guess it is evening there. You've never seen their free living stage? Well, if you Google, like, uh, can you show us on the LM? I, I've never seen a chrysophyte, like the actual organism. I only find them as scales or cysts. Uh, I guess because I process my samples. Um, I would have to do like capture one live and I'm not even sure I would know what that looks like um, like for most of them I'm so used to seeing them in this sort of stage um, I know what the cyst looks like right I'm pretty good at that uh, and I know what the scales look like because um, they have little scales that cover their surface that are made of silica so they end up having these little plates that you can observe um, and not all of them look like oranges. Some of them have really intricate patterns on them. Um, the spines, we saw one earlier that was like a cannonball thing inside of a oligocyra. Maybe I'll find it, maybe this is one. Here's a chrysophyte cyst with an Audi. So I was saying there's innies and Audis. Uh, this one has what I would call an Audi. Uh, that's like a belly button term, right? People call an Audi when you have your belly button sticks out. And uh, this one also has a very smooth surface. So I want to just sort of look in here and see if I got the focus good. And it appears that I did. Um, I didn't want to have to wait for it to come all the way through to figure out if I actually got it in focus. Um, but I am going to take a picture of this guy as well. So we have one innie, one Audi. Um, those are different species uh, of chrysophytes. So whether it makes an outward deflected or inward deflected hole uh, is definitely driven by species level. A little cherry bomb, yeah, not not too dissimilar. Um, how does a cyst form on a plant or a gall? No, they like curl up into a ball and they sort of secrete it, uh, I think. So the organism, I don't know if they secrete it around themselves or they secrete it and they climb in it. But um, it's, uh, it's part of a, well, chrysophytes are a type of golden algae. So they belong roughly in the same kind of thing as diatoms. Um, in that they have silicious skeletons and that they're a type of algae, they photosynthesize, they're microscopic. They're kind of like plantimals, like the way that diatoms are kind of plantimals, like they don't really fit in the plant kingdom perfectly and they don't fit very perfectly. Well, they definitely don't fit into the animal kingdom, but they, they move around. So uh, there's not a whole lot of plants that crawl, um, but there are some algae that crawl. So it's kind of interesting that, the, you know, like they fit into this they used to call them proteist, but proteist is like a garbage category. I mean, plantimals not like a whole lot better than proteist, but proteist is like there's things that are clearly animals that are in the proteist group and things that are also clearly algae that belong in the proteist group. Um, so these are kind of things that kind of, you know, they don't fit conformably in our system, um, our classification scheme system. So uh, we, you know, we have a very narrow view of, of what's a plant and what's an animal. Um, and as a result, uh, we, we have some things that, you know, they're like plants, but they crawl around. They got chloroplasts, they're autotrophic, but they can also be heterotrophic. Um, it's just confusing, right? Like there's, it doesn't fit perfectly. Science is messy. Um, and classification schemes, the more closely you look at them, the messier they get. So um, 
anyway, chrysophytes and diatoms are kind of closely related, and um, they don't. I don't think they actually like attach to anything. I think they just climb in like a diving bell or something and go to the bottom of the lake with it. Yeah, forearms are a type of protease, but they're just like amoeba, so. <laughs> forearms. Uh, yeah, foram is foraminifera. Sorry, uh, I can't type while I'm doing it, but I try to follow ent uh, entomology uh, taxonomy. I didn't get how messy it can be. Yeah, sure, for insects, it's just as bad. Um, uh, I mean, <laughs> at least for insects, you kind of know which broad group it belongs in, which is, uh, I mean, there's some questions for some of the algae, we just don't even know where to stick them. I mean, at least you know it's an insect, right? You can count the number of legs most of the time, and, and that will get you kind of close. Uh, for diatoms and, I don't know, chrysophytes and cryptophytes and uh, you, I don't even know what to do with the euglena. I mean, they're super weird. They're like an algal organism that acts like an animal. Um, this is a cool sponge spicule that we see right here. Gonna, Addy never rotates. That's the one thing that I think maybe she needs to learn to do a little bit more is uh, turn the stage to make the stage do her bidding. Uh, 350 probably. Uh, because our stage can actually rotate. It'll also tilt, uh, but I haven't taught Addy how to use the tilt function yet. And I don't recommend it for people who are just starting because you could actually break the instrument by tilting. Um, whereas rotating... You can't hurt anything unless you got a bunch of different sized samples, which we don't. So uh, this is a cool little sponge spicule. You can see it's got a crazy spine sticking off of it in every direction. Um, and I think this just would be called a sclera, mega sclera. Uh, I don't, I guess it's, I guess I'd have to measure it. I think it has to be bigger than a, 100 microns to be a mega square. Otherwise, it gets called a micro square. Um, maybe while it's taking the picture, I'll measure. I can sneak a measurement in. Eighty-three. So technically, a micro square. I learn things sometimes. This is one of the things I've learned from Chad's class. I learned a little bit about sponges. I learned a little bit about chrysophytes. I learned a little bit about, um, I would say mostly about sponges. I've learned a lot about phytoliths as well. Um, he's teaching a class on microfossils in geoscience and archaeological sciences. And so earlier we were talking about uh, fecal spherulites, and that's what they're doing in their lab today. And last week they did calcium oxal oxalate crystals, and I don't know what they're doing next week. Anyway, they've been sort of working their way through the carbonaceous microfossils. Um, I guess maybe we're going to look at nanofossils at some point. Um, you know, the marine nanofossils. Uh, and then I'm not sure what else. Uh, but they're particles that are used in anthropology more than anything else. So they're kind of cool for me to learn because I don't do anthropology so much. Uh, let's see. Um, oh, P Pax helping you out with forams. That's good. Um, Luan says some chrysophytes live like colonies. Oh, they do. Yeah, denobrian is a good example. Um, denobrian do live in colonies. Um, they're more like vase shaped than these ones. Um, and they usually don't make it through digestion. So I don't know if they are completely solidified or very well solidified. <laughs> hey Rams Reef, how's it going? Uh, did you give him a shout out? I don't know. I guess I could do it. I'd be so lazy and make Pac do all my work. What the heck? It's cyanide teacups? Thank you for the subscription, cyanide. It's nice to see you. Um, you know, here in my channel, uh, usually you're not awake by this point. I think if I just stay up until th stay. Um, on the SEM until 4 p.m., then you will get up probably every time. 
I should stop being so selfish and stay up later into my, you know, stream so that I get more cyanide that way. I think it'd be worth it, honestly. Um, mind of a snail. <laughs> uh, you're giving me flashbacks from that baby puppet that you guys had on the other day where the person put the baby legs on their mouth. Um, I'm having trauma. <laughs> so... Um, uh, oh, you're working on animations. Okay. Um, yeah, cool. Oh, and Devil and Mrs. J, hello. Um, I'm, I'm just getting close to the end of the stream here. I was promising people I was going to stop. Uh, and then I got this sponge micro square. Uh, um, maybe I'll just take one more picture and then we'll raid somebody. Um, I've got to get to work on stuff. I've got to give a quiz tomorrow. Um, so I have to write that still. And um, I also have to work on my Dr. Mo lecture. So um, this week's um, lecture for Dr. Mo, which is a, hey, a virtual reality thing that I do, um, on uh, YouTube is about uh, parasites. So it's pretty interesting, but a lot of work on my part. What is going on, Amis? Your images? I'll be done in a minute. You will be? Yeah. Okay. Well, maybe five minutes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I can wait while I take your... Um, don't touch. How much is this thing? $10,000? No. The body of that camera costs $2,000. The lens costs $3,000. So that's $5,000. What is this? Uh, is this a, like a 2000 No, here it is. This is not what this is. It's a 300 millimeter objective for a micro four thirds camera, which makes it actually a 600 millimeter objective. And then it has a two times teleconverter on it, which means it's actually equivalent of a 1200 millimeter camera. You can't hold your hands. Enough for that. Uh, it's actually got stabilization that's so good you can shoot stars without any sort of a tripod. You so so. Without any sort of a I'm tripod. So Why are you jealous? Just buy one. I don't have the money. Uh, you make more money than me. You should be able to afford it. Yeah, you don't have a house in Puerto Rico. Well, I mean, you got to just make your. You've got to live with one of your decisions. You can either have a camera. I could actually buy a camera like this, but. But? I could. So, what's holding you back? That's what I'm asking. This is a. Are you on? Are you on? on uh, are you, have you just recorded me? You're being recorded, yes. We're streaming live into Twitch. So, oh. we are looking at a Phytolith fragment. And this is a piece of a leaf, and that is the guard cells on a, a stoma, on a leaf fragment. And they've been solidified, and so this has been digested, and we're still getting a pretty clear image of the guard cells. Uh, the cells are gone, but uh, the plant, you can see the actual like boundaries of the plant cells and the cell walls, um, the long cells of a plant. So this is the leaf. And that's the underside of the leaf has these little special cells called stoma or stomata. News, and um, the, uh, that's the actual cell. And I'm going to take this as my last picture for the day. And then I'm going to stop streaming. And maybe I'll go take some pictures of birds. We'll see. Oh. But I've got to work on my lectures. Okay, so there's this. And now I'm going to shut down all of my stuff. And uh, I got something. Oh, I got a new follow. Thank you. Um, all right. So I'm going to find someone. We're going to sort of raid here at the end of our stream. Rams Reef seems like they're awake, so maybe we'll do them. And I want to thank everybody for hanging out. This is good. Oh, there's this, uh, 
it's amazing how I was able to. You've already been vaccinated, right? Did you get the vaccine? No. You're not? Okay. You're not doing it? My doctor said I shouldn't. Have to do it. Oh, okay. You have a medical reason not to? Yeah. Oh, okay. Anyway, what's... Are you being recorded? Yeah, I told you. We're streaming. Oh, I, thought you, I thought you were off. Oh, you're waiting for that one. What's the, the picture's being taken. What is the group called? Uh, it's... Uh, this is... Uh, Twitch. Rams Reef. Here we go. And I'm going to hit that, and then we will get our raid going. So we'll take all of our viewers over to Rams Reef's channel. He's got uh, an aquarium. We can see what's going on with the fish and the shrimp. Perfect. And thanks everybody for hanging out. And for Addy, for helping us with the stream in the first half of it, we collect a lot of cool diatom images for Addison's uh, research. And thanks for all the subscriptions and the new follows and the raids that we got today. Very nice. Okay, uh, that's it for today. And we'll see you guys all next time. Just once a week? Twice. Well, for how long? An hour? Usually I do two hours. Four hours a week? Something like that. How many followers do you have? Uh, 1,400. And there's usually about four, there's 40 people that were watching our stream. That's fantastic. And my intention 